Hi everyone, it's Kevin McQuano here from Enterprise Lab. I hope you're well and welcome to the League of Disruptors show. Uh, I'm joined today by Warren Ryan and I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a second. The League of Disruptors show is um, actually a, a showcase which has been built by myself where I interview business owners, entrepreneurs and experts from all over the world to really look and put spotlights into their geniuses. So we want to get under the skin and behind the scenes of what they're doing, why they're doing it that particular way, and and and, and everything that needs to happen uh, to help you build the business of your dreams and desires. So today I have the, none other than the legend of who we call Warren Ryan. You'll probably see him on your screens over here. What's up, Warren? How's it going, Katani? You okay? Yeah, good, good, good. So, what do we have on Warren? The mind mechanic. We're going to ask you a little bit about what the mind mechanic is all about. Warren, for, for those of you who don't already know, he's a motivational speaker. Um, over the last three years, he's already reached half a million people. He's an international speaker. I know more recently he went out to the Caribbean and Grenada and stuff, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, he's the founder and um, and the director and the, the inspiration behind the Fearless Speaking Academy. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. I've seen some of the work that you've been doing and it's just phenomenal. And I love this bit. He's UK's answers to Tony Robbins. So I'm going to definitely hold you on that one basically today. So um, Warren, tell, tell us more about who you are and... For those of uh, for those people who haven't seen you before, you know your story of how you got to where you are. Over to you. Perfect. So let me take you because when I tell you the story on behind why I do what I do, it will all make sense. So I grew up in Oxford, famously known for the universities and the cathedrals. But I grew up on like the rundown council estate in Oxford called the Greater Lease, the oldest so of Oxford young people, I've had four young people, four, four um, siblings, and my mum had me at 17 years old. Being so young, my mum went through things where she went through depression, domestic abuse. So as a child, being six years, seven years old, I witnessed things a child shouldn't see. I witnessed my mum using not to drugs. My mum wasn't maternal, so I had to kind of defend for myself. Mm -hmm. And I, my family got split up when I was eight years old, we went into care. And I went from home to home, felt a bit like the, um, the black sheep of the family. Mm -hmm. That had a massive impact on my confidence. I thought I was worthless. I spent my school, like my school life trying to fit in, tried to, trying to impress people. And that led me to a place of going through depression. I went through depression at the age of 20 years old. And my depression was a catalyst of the suppressed emotions that I had from a child that I could never dealt with because I'm a man and men don't cry. And I just bottled it all in. And it just all, one day it just came out. I, I split up from a very toxic relationship. Hmm. And it all came out of once. The things that are, like seemed appealing to me before, like going to nightclubs every weekend, it lost its wow factor. Mm. And I was in a place where I was literally in a place where I don't want to live no more. I had lost hope for life. Things that I loved before, I didn't love before. I don't know, things that I loved before, I no longer loved it at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. And I got to my lowest when I went to a GP and I think what I really wanted at that point in my life was someone to say it's going to be okay, someone to show me like affection mm -hmm. and, and what it was, it was the GP ticking boxes and saying I'm depressed and I need counselling and have some antidepressants. Mm. And the journey changed for me. Like, the journey like just started at that point when, because when I got home, that was the place in my life where I said I couldn't live no more. I couldn't do this no more. I was never going to take drugs because I wanted to be in control. Like the thought of not having control of my life and having to take drugs, I was like, I'd rather die. And 
I, I remember praying to God that night and saying, I can't do this no more. And this is this is how crazy it is in my life. How, how crazy it is. The day after, I have a phone call out of the blue. I apply for this coaching job in America a year beforehand. And I didn't get a job because I didn't have the right qualifications. Okay. But they, yeah, so, so, they, so they, they phoned me the day after. And they, I don't know, they phoned me the day after I went to the GP and they yeah. said, hey, Warren. I've got this, there's this job opportunity in America. And I was a bit confused. I was like, who is this? And it was like, oh, you applied for this job a year ago. And then it starts to kind of, um, I start to remember, oh yeah, I applied for that job a year ago. And they said, someone dropped out at the last minute. Do you want to take the opportunity? And I took that as a sign. And I said, yeah. And I had the phone call on the Monday and I left on Friday to America, the first time in my life. And I was coaching football to children. Wow. And when I, yeah, so when I was coaching football to children, like you, it's, it's very hard to be down when you're with children. It's very hard to be depressed when you're with children, especially American children, because they, they, they think you're famous because you're English. So I'm like, hello guys. And they're like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> How many, how, many, how, many times, how many times did they say they love your accent? <laughs> all, the time, all the time, literally. I felt famous. When I went over there, do you know Harry Potter? I was like, yes. <laughs> oh my God. Do, like, do you know the Queen? Of course, I have tea with Queen. <laughs> oh my God. And for me, it was because it was such a new environment. Yeah. It, it, it played a key part in, in changing my state. Hmm. So I was depressed before, and moving to America didn't cure my depression, but what it did, it shifted my focus. So my focus was on this new environment, I'm coaching kids football, oh. I love football, football's not work, so therefore I felt good in the day, but then at night, this is when my depression hit me, anxiety, panic attacks would hit me, so I was still going through these dark times alone. Yeah, I was, I was going to say on that bit, um, obviously when you are surrounded by others, you're, you're, you're kind of feeding off their energy, I, I, I guess. Um, and then when you're on your own, I suppose, you know, you're, you're left with your thoughts and your own energy. And I guess you could, you could almost become um, a little bit complacent thinking, yeah, I am feeling better, but actually really still deep down in your heart, nothing's really changed. It's just the environment around you that's changed really at this moment in time. So what, do, what did you have to do to really kind of push out that? So what I did, this is kind of a bit of a fate moment. I said to myself in America, I'm going to find the root cause of my depression. I don't know how, because I, I don't know anything about the mind but I'm going to find the root cause because I wasn't born depressed. I'm going to find the root cause of it. Mm. And I happened to, I happened to land in the same city as a speaker called Eric Thomas. Okay. So I was, I was coaching football in Chicago and after we coached football, we, we, we would go onto the beach and us Brits would be on the beach speaking <laughs> to like the American girls and they were like oh my god you're from england like yes you're from england <laughs> but when you're in america right as you know going to america they've got super size right you can go to white castle five guys and you can get like massive drinks massive fries burgers and i was like okay i'm only in america like just just the once so therefore i'm gonna go all in so when i was on this beach i felt a bit self-conscious because i looked down I had a bit of a gut and I'm not joking, on this beach, every <laughs> guy that was on this beach, I'm not even lying at the time, every guy that was on this beach had an eight pack. Had, it, was like what? It, was, it was like Baywatch. It was like Baywatch. I was like, oh. I'm going to put my t shirt back on. <laughs> I'm going to put my t shirt back on. I, I wouldn't have taken my t shirt off in the first place, mate. Trust me, if I was there. No way. I've only got a one pack. And that's a solid years of investment into that, brother. I'm telling you, still, wow. So, so, so yeah. you kind of you you're going through this kind of mode. Obviously, these environments are changed. You've got all this energy, the brightness. I suppose the weather and the condition and the environment out there is completely different to what you're experiencing in the UK. Then you've got all these copious amounts of food with the supersized me, and you felt like you're you're now it was it, you know part of your body had transformed as much as your sort of your your energy. So, so you know, what, what kind of, 
Tell me more about the point you got to, the point of where you thought, right, this is enough, I've had enough of this, you know, your, your personal energy, you know, the fact that you're looking at your body and saying everyone's got an eight pack and you've, you know, you're there probably with a four pack. I know you, you're, you're pretty much, you know, kind of shredded. You, by the way, we're going to see Jamie Alden next, uh, tomorrow, so we'll see how shred looks basically. Oh, but, back, yeah, back. <laughs> <laughs> but, but essentially what went through your mind to make and then what is it that you did that really kind of flashed it over and said right that's it uh, that enough is enough you know just take us through that a little bit yeah so when, when i'm seeing these guys with eight packs that was the inspiration that i needed right i was like i'm gonna get myself an eight pack i've got a lot of time in america so i'm gonna go onto youtube i type went on youtube i was like i need to listen to some sort of like not self-development but motivational music, a bit of Eminem, a bit of mm -hmm. Lose Yourself, Big Nemo, yeah, all of that stuff, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, 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 But I happened to come across a video called When You Want to Succeed As Bad As You Want to Breathe by Eric Thomas. When You Want to Succeed As Bad As You Want to Breathe, okay? That's correct. Okay, wow, okay. So, so I'm watching this video, and by the time I've watched this video, I said to myself, Warren, like in the past, when I said I wanted to be successful, I did not want it bad enough. I was doing what everybody else was doing and expecting more. This video hit me in a place where I've never been hit before and it made me so intrigued. I, did, I wasn't just listening to this video, I felt the video. And I was like, who is this Eric Thomas guy? Who is he? Mm -hmm. So I started to research Eric Thomas. And then the second video that I watched I see Eric Thomas speaking in front of a thousand plus people mm. and he's talking about his past, but mm. he's on a stage, but he's, he's proud of it. And he's mm. saying, my mom's on crack cocaine. And like really motivational. I'm thinking at first I'm British, so he's a bit over the top. Mm. And then I'm thinking, why are you sharing? Why are you sharing things that happen behind closed doors? Mm. Like you don't share that. You keep that to yourself. Mm. People are gonna baptize you people are going to judge you mm. they're going to use that against you mm. i just didn't understand it but at the same time i was saying me too me too me too me too eric thomas for me was the closest i've ever got of a male in my life like i, I grew up without knowing who my dad was mm. he was the closest person of a man a male role model i've ever got close with someone who could relate to me mm. that that by doing that it inspired me to share my story so I shared my story on social media on a blog and I just this just to say before I shared this story I hadn't told my best friends right but I knew I had to share my story because what Eric how he made me feel, the belief he given me, he's given me, mm. I just knew it was a duty for myself to share that story. Mm. So I share my story on social media, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Mm. But when I shared it, I had people messaging me from Australia, Africa, America, saying, I don't know who you are, it's 3 a.m. and I'm reading your story. And Warren, do you know what? I was thinking about taking my life and I've just read your story. Wow. And you've inspired me. You made me realize that I'm not alone. Warren, I'm going to use this shit from my past to help others. I'm going to turn this pain into strength. And this is what I this is what I learned from Eric Thomas mm. on how to like it like, like it doesn't matter what happens to you. It's all based on the meaning that you give it. Mm. So I gave my past a negative meaning, and I was a victim. Therefore, I was in depression. Eric Thomas was saying it with pride. He turned his pain into strength. So okay. that was what was, 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 was the, the, the tipping point in my life, where from that point in my life, I had found my purpose in that, in that message. When I had people who were on death's doors, who were about to end their life, mm. and then said to Warren, you've inspired me, I can't thank you enough. That moment, I fell in love with people. That moment, I found my purpose. Wow. I found my purpose. 
That's, in, that's incredible. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing uh, that with us as well. I mean, you know, what the other thing there that you said that I picked up on the fact that you were about to blog, you know, your your life experience, and this is something that you hadn't even spoken to your your friends about as well. I mean, that's tough. You know, there are things that you're going to come out which uh, which they perhaps could perceive and judge you on. Now. I kind of want to move into sort of that that transition you know you fell in love with people you know you were talk you know you talk about your story about turning your pride uh, your pain into pride and strength um, and you know the the kind of inspirer and conspire of that being eric thomas i mean i've known you for for a couple of years now and i've seen you sort of in and out of different things etc and i know that one of the things that you're always true to is the the effort and the energy that you put into every single piece whether it's three people in a room or 300,000 people in a room you know it's got the same energy the same intensity i've also you know i mean we'll talk about the fearless fearless speaking academy very short you know how many people you you're actually um you're impacting on but i want to ask a question to you about that uh, about the impact are you conscious are you really really conscious about how much impact you are making on people and when this impact comes or is this a case of when they just respond and react to you that that you kind of know i mean you don't go out searching for testimonials in that sense so how do you know the impact that you're making such a great question for me um, I, yeah, for, for me, it's what kept me alive, you know, it's what kept me alive was that purpose of helping people and I set a, I set a target on reaching a million lives. I set a target on a million lives. I knew I had to be consistent on social media. Mm. I knew I had to go to speaking engagements before I could even speak. I had to just get on that stage and share my story. Mm. So I'm no, I'm I'm not, I'm not um, conscious of how many lives I'm touching. I just, I, but I know that I'm touching and I'm I'm, in, I'm changing lives. I know that, I know that, mm. and that's what keeps me alive. That's what keeps me driven. That that's what gives me the energy to keep. Because when we talk about the business side of it as well, but I didn't want to get in business. Mm. I only got into business. We live in a system where you need money as much as you need oxygen. Mm. And if I want to make an impact, then I need money. So for me, yeah, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> see, sometimes I have to stop and actually reflect on the life I am impacting in. Because when I feel that, when I know that I'm changing people's lives, mm. it just gives me this, an extra boost, an extra drive to keep on pushing. No, I, I, I understand that. I, I, and the reason I ask you the question is sometimes we, we are prone to look back and think to yourself, right, okay, a, you know, how much of an impact are we making? And then we, we kind of lose ourselves into what we're trying to do this for. I mean, you know, I, I know deep heart, you know, in deep in your heart, this, there, there is love and a passion for all of this and it's the change. And, you know, you, there's parts of this that we talk about that you won't want anyone to ever go through the kind of life experience that you've had to. But the point of it is it will happen. We can't control what happens in other people's lives. What we can only do is actually have a point of impact which will allow them to change and move forward. So I think, you know, you know, speaking to you today, it's very, you're very much about a vehicle of re redirecting someone, um, you know, where you, where you come in and where you finish in that journey, you don't have so much of a, um, um, you know, you don't have so much of an inclination. You're kind of more of a look, I'm here now, I'm here to make this impact. So tell me more, you know, what is the mind mechanic, you know, in the sense of what does it mean that you are a mind mechanic? Tell me now. <laughs> Good, that's good okay so yeah i started to call myself the mind mechanic because my transformation started with reprogramming my mindset mm -hmm. and i left school with no gcse so at the time i believed i wasn't intelligent so i needed to understand the mind in kind of layman's terms mm -hmm. so i related the mind like a macbook or the iphone and I call it the I mind. And with the I, I mind, mind, I the I mind. So, and I started to understand the mind in a way that who I who I thought I was wasn't actually me. 
And the, these were apps that were downloaded onto my iMind before, <laughs> like before I could speak, talk. All of these apps, these beliefs were downloaded onto my iMind. And I had so many programs that were on my iMind that were affecting my self-worth, were affecting my confidence. So what I had to do was I had to reprogram this iMind, remove the apps that was not serving me. Right. And I had to, I had to learn how to download these new habits, these new beliefs, which okay. I call apps. Okay. Yeah. So, so, what, so what, I would, what I would do is I realized the tools on how to download an app or a habit or a belief was through what I was seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, what I was hearing on a day-to-day -day basis, what I was saying, but most importantly, what I was doing. Okay. And I said to myself, if I was to do this every single day, as much as I walk, as much as I brush my teeth, for 21 days, I'm gonna create a new habit. I knew how this I mind, the mind worked. So what I did was I used my home as the environment, just like the outside world where all the big corporations spend billions of pounds on marketing, mm. the McDonald's, everyone knows McDonald's, but yet they still spend millions of pounds on mm. marketing. Mm. They have psychologists that work on the marketing and they know why people buy what they buy. Mm. So I, I use that, that same concept, mm. but in my household. So I was seeing my gratitude list every single day. I wasn't just seeing it, seeing it, immersing myself into gratitude yeah and i i knew that i couldn't be down and grateful at the same time mm. and then my what my why was what's going to get me up before my alarm clock what's okay. to keep me consistent so i was seeing my why at eye level every single day going into it what warren why am i alive who is looking up at me who's depending on me what impact am i going to make how am i going to feel once i make it so this why is just inside of me, which I programmed. And then the last one was the vision. Oh. I had no vision before. So every day, just like an architect, I'd have a plan of a vision, really specific with where I was going, the person that I had to become. And with having that vision and seeing it every single day, it would, it would enable me to achieve it twice, achieve it in my mind, then in reality. Hmm. So this is where the whole mind mechanic came from i just literally <laughs> yeah reprogram my mindset to tailor the life i have now if that makes sense no absolutely and and i love it to the fact that what you use here you talk about perception you talk about um, um attitude there are there are all you've done is you've built little apps which with different words in that you know in, in the fact the way you see things the way you react to things the things you you say but most of all most important it's the things that you do and i, I love that part about it i think to, you know we're, we're gonna i'm gonna talk more about um action in, in a little while just for those of you that are out there in the audience watching this and i can see there's quite a few of you that have come through and you're putting comments through if you've got any questions for Warren, please, please post them to me on the live stream. Um, I'll, I'll take those questions on and get them to Warren uh, before we finish. I just want to come back a little bit now. Uh, <clears throat> you've got your mind mechanic. I, I know the work that you do in terms of reaching out um, to engage people and change their lives, the impacts that you want to make. And this is kind of driven from your own story about, you know, where you've come from and where you've got to. Um, tell me something, what was the motivation for the, spe uh, the Fearless Speaking Academy that you set up? And um, I, I, I want you to really, really kind of give us some more context over what you did and how you did what you did to get it to where it is today. Because I think people sometimes on the f surface look at this and they just think, Oh, it's it's you know it's all right it's all right you know they know people and they get it's it's all right for them they don't tend to see what happens underground and I really want the you know I want people to understand what it takes to really make something happen even even if the odds are stacked up against you because I mean you go out and you label yourself as a you know the UK's answer to Tony Robbins you're putting yourself at a very high position and you're on a pedestal which is very easy for people to knock you off on. So Warren, tell us more about the Fearless Speaking Academy. What have you been doing with people in that academy? And what is it that you've been doing to make FSA what it is today? I love this question, by the way, Ken. So 
So wh where it all came from was that, like my story is, I came to London on a mega bus, which I spent five pounds on, <laughs> with 400 pounds to my name, with a burning desire to become an international speaker and to reach one million lives in five years. I was ready to burn the ships to take over the island. So when I first moved to London, I knew the process. Mm -hmm. I knew people was not gonna believe me and I don't blame them because they don't see what's in here, only I do. But I was gonna show up, that's what I was gonna do. So mm -hmm. I went to schools, I went to colleges, I went to Canary Wharf, I spoke with traders. I said, don't pay me, don't pay me anything. Just let me add value. Let me add value to your students. Mm -hmm. And what I started to do is I started to transform students who were shy into becoming expressive and being confident and giving them like being that high performance coach in their mm -hmm. life where they was getting be better results in their school, but in their, in their life skills as well. And just sharing what I've learned about the mind and making them understand it through the whole I mind concept. Let me just let me just cut in there very quickly. Um, you know, there are so many people out there that are in the co coaching industry or performance and stuff like this. What do you believe it is? Uh, was it? Do you think it's your charisma or your character that made people attract and magnetize to you? Because sometimes it's you know that people have what expertise to give, but often enough they don't have that connection with their with their audience. So what is it that you, you, do you think you had at that moment in time that was making people kind of listen to you? What I realized was that once you convince yourself, convincing others becomes easy. Mm. I was 100% sold on it because I've walked it. Like, so what I was talking, I was walking. I knew the power of the mind and I realized that some people weren't gonna see the picture that I was seeing because they were looking through a different window. So they weren't seeing the view that I was looking at, they were looking at a different view, but I knew because I went from being shy, not being able to communicate well, to being able to communicate well, and being confident, to be able to speak in front of an audience, because when I first started speaking, I was terrified, <laughs> I was terrified, and I was so scared, but it was my purpose that got me on that stage, it was my purpose that got me to London, mm. so yeah, so it was that whole situation where I'm, I'm, I'm sold on the idea and when you're sold on the idea you don't have to convince like you don't have to um impress you just say i can all i have to do to be responsible for getting results in people's lives that's all you have to do be responsible for getting results in people's lives and i believe i can help those people who were one step two step four or five steps behind me mm. and that they were the people who helped me so I just want to emphasize on this, Warren, and this is this is amazing. It it is that there are two things that I want to emphasize. Number one, you've got to believe in your own ability. You've got to walk your talk. You know that's the bit that I want to get back out to these audiences in the fact that you know whatever it is you're doing, even if you're not in the coaching business, you've still got to believe in everything that you're doing and believe that you can achieve. And I think the second thing about this is. Um, the responsibility part that I just, you know, you just mentioned, I, and, and this is something that I have a big, um, you know, pain in the butt about. Um, the industry that we work in is really personal development as much as, you know, um, performance development and stuff like this. You know, we are people's people in that sense. We, I develop people as much as more than businesses now nowadays in my career. But I think there's there should be an ethical code with what you do with people. You know, and the fact that, you know, they're putting their life almost in your hands. You're almost, you've got to believe that you are ultimately responsible because they're now looking up to you for inspiration and guidance. That it's not just a, you know, we can make X amount of pounds or dollars off a client, but there is a responsibility of navigating them through whether it's a short journey or a long term, a long term journey. So what's your view on this whole thing about having this ethical responsibility? And you know, what is it that FSA brings to people that has that ethical responsibility as well? I would say to be a fantastic speaker or to be a fantastic coach is you've got to find yourself first. And I believe when you find yourself first, you'll know the key to life is contribution. So therefore, when you realize that money's the byproduct, it won't, that won't be the driving force. You see some coaches that get into the industry for the lifestyle. Oh yeah, I get to travel around, get to work at home. 
But when it goes deeper than that, when you get that feeling of success because your clients get that success, when their success is like your success and you get a passion behind it, mm. when you go that extra mile, when you don't feel like it's work, that's when you're in a place where this is what I was meant to do. This is what I was born to do. Okay. So, 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 yeah, the FSA, how the FSA got started for me was that someone said to me, Warren, I got a story. Okay. I've got so much knowledge, Warren. I've got, and I've got an NLP practitioner qualification. I've got a story. I can help people. But Warren, some, for some reason, when I get on stage, I get this anxiety. I get sweaty palms. And then <laughs> what he said, what he said to me after, was what created the Fearless Speaking Academy. Because yeah. what he said to me after was this, but Warren, everyone gets nervous on stage. Yes. Everyone gets fearful on stage. It was like a light bulb that pinged for me. And he said to me, Warren, do you, like, Warren, how do you deal with your nerves and your fear? And I said, I don't, I don't fear speaking no more. But no, everyone fears speaking. This is what I said to him. Warren, um, I, said, I, said, I said to him, my focus is not on me. Hmm. My focus is on the audience. And from knowing how the mind works, you can't focus on two things at the same time. Yeah. And in, in that in that place, this is what sparked the Fearless Speaking Academy. I said, you know what? Rather than me trying to help the world, let me train leaders to nope. reach based on my age, my race, the language that I speak. Yeah. So if I can coach people, because they already have what they need, all yeah. I need is to remove the blockage. Yeah. So that they get out of their own head and they just let it flow from the subconscious. That's that's where the, the feel is speaking can be birthed. And I, I would coach someone for one day. So I have I would have ten people in the morning. They'd come in with anxiety, fear. I break down the fear so that they could justify why they was feeling that sense of fear. Mm. Make them understand that it's false evidence appearing real. False evidence. Make them understand. Yeah. Yeah. And make them understand. Stop being so selfish. Stop being so selfish and making it just because the lights are on you. It's not about you. Mm. And when it's not about you, it doesn't matter if you make mistakes. You're gonna make mistakes because you fail your way to success. But that. That part out there, okay, how are you gonna feel if you impact one person's life? And when I put that training in place and there they were in that state of mind, you were seeing people who were nervous, who had anxiety to be in authentic speakers, being that person who they are behind closed doors. That's mm. what my philosophy is all about. Being you. Because when you are you, yeah. you can flow, reach people who can relate to you. Mm. So that's where it Came out. Amazing, and I've just seen, you know, it's, it's just just a catalog. I mean, more recently, I'm gonna, you know, we'll come to Grenada in a second. Uh, it was Grenada that you went to, wasn't it? Or did yes. you? Yeah. Grenada. So we'll, we'll we'll come to that in a second. But more recently, I think actually one of your one of your FSA um, graduates was running an event in Birmingham, and I think you took a team of your FSA under understudies in, in you know to go and speak on on these kind of stages and this is the bit that i i, I want to kind of reach out to people um what we do the way we do it it's you know it's very surface driven i mean at the end of the day there's only so much so many pictures that you can put up about what you do and you know unless people um come in and experience it they're never gonna fully fully understand and this this is kind of going out to, to, to those that are actually listening with who want to do things like performance related work or they want to be a life coach or a, or a business coach or, or any sort of coach where they're actually working with people. What, Warren, tell, tell, tell us, what is the commitment, in, not just in time, but energy that you have to put in, you know, not just into the business that you've developed or, or the academy, but it's more, more, more in, in, in terms of the energy and the commitment you have to put into the person, because you've built a framework. You've got your eye mind stuff for the, with the, you know, with the mechanics, you know, the the the, uh, the mind mechanics stuff. You've got the structure for FSA, which takes people through, so that everyone understands. There's ten of you, and then we do this. But I just want you to share a little bit about the 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 the, the work, the effort you have to put in 
per person, you know, the energy. Just talk a little bit about that, um, you know, so the audiences can get a bit of a feel of what it takes really to, to support a person. What I would say first is every FSA that I run, any workshop that I do, I don't eat that whole day. So my focus is completely consumed with the people that I work with. And what helps them to get great results is the belief that I have in them. Because I know they have a mind, they have an amazing mind, they've got amazing potential, but you're not going to be able to drive that Ferrari if you don't know how to drive that Ferrari. Like if you don't know how to do the gears and to, to turn the steering wheel, you've got an amazing car, but it's going nowhere. So for me, I see people, I see them not for where they are, for where they, for where they could be. And my belief is I'm, I'm sold. I'm sold on the results that they want. I'm sold that they can get there. I just need to make them believe that they can get there and show them the strategies. But my whole conviction, the energy, the whole convincing, mm. it makes them themselves and then they just get amazing results. And, and um, you know, so guys, uh, if you're out there listening to this, you know, as I say, any questions that you have uh, for Warren, I'm, I'm, t I'm going to be taking questions. Please, please. Uh, send them through on the live feed. I'll pick them up and actually get them to Warren. Uh, but while we're waiting for some of these questions to come through, I think it's 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 really important. We talked about the ethical responsibility about personal development. You know, those that work in the industry seriously have, you know, the fact that you've got to switch your mind on and off of different people because they've got to feel like you're listening to them, not just hearing them in, 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 yeah. in all these aspects. I think, you know, it's. I, I want to move on to your, your networking capabilities and your activities because it's, uh, you know, and, you know, we hear the saying before your net worth is equal to your network and all this kind of stuff. And we're going to talk a little bit about hustle, in, uh, you know, in a second as well. And, you know, how the word is used over sparingly. But um, you started out very humble beginnings with realization with the whole Eric Thomas thing when you were over in the US. You got you got back to the UK, five pound on a mega bus to, to London. Don't really know met so many people You've got 400 pounds to your name that's only going to get you to a certain point in time you know in terms of yeah. affordability to live and all this kind of stuff you've got you know you started to believe in this process and program whether it's maps and all these kind of things um and then you got started and i know that you you've used social quite a lot and you still do but just talk to the talk to us or t talk us through what you really had to do to build that network because it's not every day you get a, a, a is it a Caleb Maddox coming on the 10th of December to your event or a Juvan Langford or you know these guys are, are hard to get hold of you know my you know so tell us what is it what's what's your secret what's your secret so my secret is that number one, one my purpose is bigger than myself so as much as I want to look after my family yeah. I know that everybody else in this world wants to look after their family. So whereas before, I would create a little boat, put my family on it, and row myself to the promised land and look after my family, right? So what I did was this. Why don't I break my boat down and get everybody else to break their boats down and create one big massive boat? And this massive boat, we've all got different roles to play. But it's, it's got an engine now. So we've got an engineer that can create all the engine. We've got everyone on board. Mm. We've got no dead weight. Sometimes you might get dead weight that get on the boat and they just want to get to promised land without mm. putting no work in. Mm. So what I did was, I always started with the why. So whenever I met someone, I read a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. This book for me was a life-changing book. Yeah. I started to understand people and I was studying human behavior or why people do what they do. Mm. And I found it hard uh, dislike or hate someone because I knew that I didn't know the bottom I didn't see the bottom half of the iceberg mm -hmm. so whatever they were at you they were hurting ten times more inside sure so I think then I started to then, then I started to observe for example I started to observe animals so a dog a dog lives rent free right a dog, yeah a dog lives rent free it gets tummy rubs it gets fed it gets looked after because if the owner goes out to the shop and it comes back, the dog greets them like they've been gone for 10 years. Yeah. What that, what that tells me is that people are emotional beings. 
So if you acknowledge people, if you celebrate people, mm. they just want to be they, like they, they, they acknowledge you, mm. and they want to support the journey because the journey is not a, a, a um, it's not a selfish journey. Mm. It's a journey where it's a big, and everybody else is going to get on it as well. So what I would start to do is I'd find people who shared the same beliefs and the same values mm. and say to them, I'm going to promised land, I'm going to promised land, but my destination is not exactly where your destination is, but what it can do is I can take you to some point of that destination yeah. and then you can create a boat and do the same. So, so what I would do is I would just go and serve, serve, how can I help you? How can I add value to your business? Mm. So I would do my research, I would find people who are more successful than myself and say to them, how can I help you? Or actually look at what they're doing and say, I can help you with this. And then what I realized was that visibility is key. So some of them have an amazing- vis Visibility is key. So from, you know, from a network perspective, what I, I guess what you're saying here is if you're not showing up, you're not showing at all. In, in, that, in that respect. I mean, you, you've got to be present in that sense. Now, the reason I'm asking you questions about networking is, you know, there is, it's very Marmite-ish about where you go and, you know, the, the events that you're at and how you approach people and stuff like this. Now, you know, the fact that you've touched base on things like value, you've talked about giving value and, you know, understanding the whys and stuff like this, you know, boy, it's, it's, you know, just for those that perhaps find it a little bit daunting to get out there and say, hey, you know, who are you? How are you? And, or, or, or sell themselves to a certain extent. And I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to sell yourself. I think you promote yourself through your values. Just, just do you have any tips for people that, um, you know, who, who think they suck at networking, basically? You know, what tips would you give to someone out there that thinks, I don't like doing this, but I just do it because I know I have to do it? And you saying that, oh, what I would say is, it's like a house on fire that has your family inside. You don't oh. go, do you know what? Oh, it's nice and warm in there. I'm going to go in there and get a suntan. It's it's scary. <laughs> of course, it's scary. But but you don't you don't think about it because your family are inside. You go in you go into that house that's on fire yeah. and you rescue your sibling. The same is with networking or doing something that you're scared of. You've got to ask yourself. Why am I doing this? Mm. Once the why, once the why becomes bigger than the fear, you'll jump. Okay, you, you'll jump off that cliff. But that's my point, once Warren. That's my point. You see, because I think some people, what they do is, it's their motivation. It's the motivation of the networking. They think I've got to do this because I've got to get leads. So, are they doing it to get leads, or are they getting getting to know people? And then it comes up very, very instantly. You know, if someone's fake. If someone's lying, you know, if someone is only has one pint of interest. So, so you, what's your viewpoint on the fact that, you know, okay, even if you are preparing yourself to go out to networking, that you don't go out with the intention to try and get new business. Um, you know, if the motivation is not right, then you're not going to come across right, are you really? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's selling yourself first, knowing that you've got tons and tons of value. Mm. Okay. So people should feel privileged just to be around you because you know mm. so much because you're doing it behind closed doors. You, you have to convince yourself first. And what I say is if you serve enough people, you'll get everything that you want. So people can tell, people can tell when you reach out to them yeah. and you want something from them. Yeah. It's like an odor. Yeah. They, they can smell that. Okay. So, so, the so, so, so let's touch, let's just quickly touch base on, this is where the discussion starts getting really disruptive. I won't even let him finish what he's saying. Uh, I want to I, I want to touch base on this word serve. You see, because you hear it a lot. People got to you know they've got to they've got to have authority. They've got to have authenticity. They've got to hustle and they've got to serve. What does the word serve mean to you? Serve means giving from your heart and not expecting something in return from that transaction. Good. Good. And, and, and then from, 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 from that basis, it's, uh, you know, even when you do serve, um, <clears throat> like you say, the people, you know, people can sense when they need the kind of help. What is it that you believe it's about you that people come up and say, Warren, can you help me? You know, uh, you know, there was, there was a time a couple of years ago where Warren wasn't Warren. It was just, he was someone else. You know, he, as you said, we did the five pound mega bus and got to London. Now it's kind of a situation where you have 
and I hate using the word the tribe. You have a tribe, and you have a, you have, you have this kind of thing that's going through. What do you think it is about what you do that makes people say, can you help me? Because I think there are people out here, um, you know, uh, people like Jamie Alderton and Jonathan McDonough who have just joined the conversations right now, who I know are leader servers in, in what they do. They just naturally magnetize people to them. So what do you, what is it, do you think it's about you and what you do that makes people come to you? I would say what makes people come to me is knowing that, for example, being a dad now, no one knows my face. No one sees my face every day. He knows it's safe. It's familiar. People say to me, Warren, why do you always use Facebook? Why are you always showing up every single day? Hmm. You can't like, like you can't lie and be consistent, right? People will see through it. So for the last four years of my life, I've been consistent every single day on Facebook, sharing the same message and sharing my journey along with it. So what happens is people see me, they, they see me every single day and I meet people who I've never met before and they say, hey, Warren, I feel like I know you. Okay. Warren, I feel like I know you. And I make a habit of sharing my why. Why am I doing this? Am I doing this for likes? Am I doing this to be the best speaker in the world? Or am I doing this to care? You know, I care. I want to add value to so many lives. Yeah. I care about people. I love people. Mm -hmm. and. I show up every single day with that love and that passion. And that's what keeps me going. It keeps me, it's, it's my why, is to leave this world a better place. And, and it's kind of like, if you look at Nelson Mandela, what did Nelson Mandela do for work? I'm sure he was financially free, but he was just a loving human being who served, who added value to people's lives. Hmm. I never met Nelson Mandela, but I've got so much respect and love for him. So why I started to attract people was that I wasn't thinking about myself. I was thinking about the big boat, the big mission, and we were going along, we're going, we're going to do it together. But at the same time, you've got to show up with me. I, I don't carry dead weight. <laughs> yeah, so, so visibility, as you said earlier, is a big key for you. And visibility on the fact that you're also telling your story live as you're going along rather than actually buffering it up and then trying to release it. And it it's almost as if people can take a, uh, a biopsy into your life at any moment in time by coming up and seeing you on things like Facebook and stuff like that. A um, little bit more about time commitments to that actually because you know there are when do you do it spontaneously do you have do you plan it do you think right okay at 10 o'clock when Noah's in bed and you know I've got everything's been done you know in terms of family wise I'm gonna I'm gonna rack on Facebook and start telling people about my life what what, what is it that you did is you know how does that how does that work so how, how it works is that I'm immersed in what I do it's who I am so when it comes, it comes to the forefront of my mind and I share it on Facebook, a message will come. And also as well, when I'm posting consistently on Facebook, it's going through me. And when it goes through me, it keeps me focused as well. Mm -hmm. So what it does, it just allows me like, I don't have a social life. I don't have those chats where you just talk about rugby or football. <laughs> everything, everything that I talk about is growth because I love it. It's not work to me. I absolutely love it. I love doing meaningful work. I don't see it as work, so let's remove the word work, but I love, I absolutely love it. So it's spontaneous, but it's just, it's become a habit. It's just, when I think of something, I'll, something I wanna share it. Because I think that knowledge that I've just, that I've just, that's just popped in my head, Somebody, yeah. somebody else who gets so much value from it. So let's, let's flip this on his head. I mean, it wouldn't be the League of Disruptors if I wasn't asking disruptive stuff. What do you what do you think? What's your opinion, and how do you feel about people that would just say, you know, flipping hell, he's always on my timeline. I'm just, you know, he just just you know doesn't he's relentless on the damn thing. You know, kind of puts me off going on onto it. What do you, what what would you what, what's your response to something like that? So my response to that is there are, there's a process. People are going to find you annoying. If you're popping up in people's timelines all the time, they're gonna find you annoying. <laughs> then they're gonna okay, they're gonna start deleting you, start talking about you, they're gonna hate you. Ah, oh my god, Warren, get off my Facebook. Ah. <laughs> and then the last stage is they end up admiring you. Because you, you start doing 
what you're saying and you're consistent. And for me, through the whole process, I would rather have haters. If I could help one person, I would rather have haters. And those haters are just secret admirers yeah. because people want you to have a good life. They want you to have a good life, but they don't want you to have a life better than theirs. So when I'm saying, oh, I'm going to Grenada or I'm, I'm traveling the world, yeah. people are like, oh, I like my life is sh like, I like my life is shit. I'm looking at you on Facebook Live saying you're going here, you're going there. It's like, but I'm not going to dim my light to make others around me feel less insecure. I'm going to shine so that it allows other people to say, do you know what? If Warren can do it, I can do it too. No, and, and, and do you know why? I'll be honest with you. The reason I ask that question is that everyone seems to try to get on that flex today. They, you know, they're, they're, everyone is trying to be be there all the time. And, and I, But it's interesting how you, you, you kind of use the metaphor of the fact that you get on there, you kind of become annoying then you kind of that you almost lose connection with these people and they hate you but then they come around to admire you and and it it, it it is a situation whereby yes we can sometimes be overwhelming with the amount that we have on 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 facebook but we're you know naturally it's coming from your heart not from your head so so the authenticity part of it that we talk about is is very much about your heart not your head in what you talk about i just want to kind of uh, come up because we're, we're we're coming in i can't believe we're almost an hour we've been speaking which has been phenomenal guys if you've got questions please 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 get them in for warren because we're going to be we're going to shutting down about five five or six minutes so you have um you've got a little event coming up on the 10th of december just a little one 1200 people probably you know potentially i mean here's talk about go hard or go home you know the fact that you've been doing you know smaller group stuff for such a long period of time you've really gone out of your way to push up um this speaker event of the year so just just for the people out there please just uh, tell us tell us a little bit more about um what what got you to think about this event what have you been through to get this event up and why is it that people should come to this event on the 10th? So this event that I've got coming up, the self development event of the year, it's an event for me, which has been three years in the making. And when I first moved to London, I lived about 20 meters from the venue of where this event is being held. And I lived in an old university. I had no bed. I had, I was sleeping on a yoga mat. And what I did every day, I would walk to Tesco's to buy um, rice and peas with no chicken because I had no money to buy the chicken. I would, walk, I would walk through the Hilton Hotel and I would walk, talk and feel as if I belonged there. And I said, one day I'm going to have an event in this hotel. <laughs> I don't know how, I'm just going to make it happen. And I'd walk through the entrance, I, I would walk through the entrance, see all like, the rich kind of like Saudi people and be like, How's it going, guys? Assalamu alaikum. And walk through, <laughs> right? Walk through, yeah, walk through, go to Tesco's, get my thing. And I would do that every time I went to go and get a tube, go to Tesco's, I'd walk through that hotel. And then when I applied for um, a thousand seater venue in London, I applied for five venues. Every venue was booked out apart from one venue. It's just destiny, wasn't that it? That one venue was the venue that I walked through. I know, I know. So I've been to a lot of events and I see a lot of events where it's kind of story, pitch, run to the back of the room, buy my program. So I thought, how do I create an event where we don't just, it's not a pitch fest where people are just buying programs left, right and center, mm. but we add mass value. We, and how do we prevent event junkies people that just go to event after event and they don't actually take action mm. so i've looked i've looked at all of these concepts and said you know what we're going to make our event engaging entertaining educating and empowering so what i've done is i've got the best influencers from around the world and these influencers give massive value and so I've put them all together on the same platform. I kind of see myself now as like the Uber for speakers. Mm. Create a platform and bring people that have value to give. The Uber of and speakers. A bit like the Uber of speakers, man. All right. Because I just, yeah, I, I see a gap for it because I never see an event where Les Brown and Tony Robbins have teamed up and they're doing it together. Mm. So I thought, 
I don't need to be Superman, right? I don't need to be Batman. We can all do this together if we want to make an impact. Mm. So you find those people who believe in collaboration, yes. who have a big influence, who are self-made, and then I want, and then they're going to be sharing their strategies and their know-how to the audience, but making it really interactive. Mm. And 1,200 like-minded people. If you surround yourself with like-minded people, so then we create, uh, we're creating a program at the back, the back end of this event as well to keep everyone together, so that what you say at that event, that you're making sure you take action after the event as well. So you've got accountability that builds into it as well, right? Yes, yeah, because I I feel like I've wasted time when I speak at an event, I'm sharing priceless information mm. and people just take it in one ear. Oh, that makes, oh my God, that makes so much sense. Yeah, but then they don't apply it. It's like, I didn't do this for that reason. Mm. If I'm sharing it and it makes sense to you and it gives you that aha moment, take action, mm. take action. Mm. So I've been like a geek. I've been like a geek with this. Like what makes someone take action? What makes them... What, how can we get their back up against the wall to say, do you know what? I can't use plan B or C. I have to go with plan A. And it, and it starts today. And that event is on the 10th of December. And we just we want amazing, incredible, like-minded people who are entrepreneurs, visionaries, people that believe in collaboration. And this, is just, this event is going to be a setup for next year where we have 10,000 people at the XL. Set it here first. 10,000 people at the XL, people. Listen to that. This time next year. And the thing is, we've got to speak as well, because I want to get you on a stage as well, <laughs> time, man. You're traveling, seeing what you're doing. Yeah, yeah and... we'll, we'll do that for sure. We'll do that for sure, I Avid. Mean, um, I would I would love to support uh, what you're doing in that campaign. So, look. 10th of December, there's 1,200 suites available. It's all about inspiration. It's all about taking action. It's all about that accountability thing. How can people get their tickets? Where do they go to get the tickets? So what they, so what they need to do is they need to go to their back garden and they're going to go... <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah so on. <laughs> so guys, what you have to do is go to self developmentevent.co.uk and currently right now we've got a buy one get one free so you buy one and you look around your family your friends who needs everyone needs it but who needs it the most so bring that friend or family member with you it's buy one get one free and it's the self development event.co.uk we with self development um, event .co uk. Warren's going to be putting it up onto the tag. I'll I'll actually put a line up here of here. I think there are. It's a two for one offer at the moment. I'm sure there are limited seats now because I know that uh, time has been moving on. He has got some phenomenal speakers in here. I mean, to get someone like Juvan Langford, who's on a world tour at the moment. I think Juvan's over in Australia um, at this moment in time. You know, you got Caleb, Caleb Maddox. I mean, this guy is just phenomenal in terms of energy and this is what i mean you, you, you warren's going to put you in front of people or put, put people in front of you that you perhaps normally wouldn't get to cross over in life so this is one of the biggest parts of the value of what warren's bringing here so guys make sure you are um clearing out your diary for the 10th of december and getting your uh, your asses down to is it it's the hilton metropole right the hilton That's metropole in, in, Lon in london so tickets will be available we will put that link up there um i'm just going to go through some real quick comments from um from here because i haven't really done any of these guys uh herman stewart says bro real men do cry um he's also talked about real men show emotions and both heart ones and anger he's he's also pushed out on the the uh, on the on the sort of support of why he does mentoring as everyone needs a mentor so it's home Street, someone that i really want to get online here as well i've had quite a lot of people that have joined the conversations today but they haven't really pushed out anything in terms of uh, uh, too many questions but i'm sure as they see the live feed come through which won't be live anymore they'll they'll add the questions through here joe dabdra has been talking about i mind that uh, because it's a classic what you've called it um uh, steve beckles abusers talked about great words from you beijus talked about great insights natasha hales in the house she's saying about hashtag find your fabulous mindset and belief plus work plus love 
equals success and that's a that's a big maths equation but I, I you're absolutely right um uh, we've got ros thornton's just joined in as well but look you know we've we've kind of come out of time here and i want to really thank you warren for for coming on sharing your insight sharing your story really talk, telling people more behind the how rather than the what and the whys of what you've been doing and, you know it's it's not often easy um you know it's important that we try and put a spotlight into this because so many people look at um, people like yourself for inspiration and then they also believe that they can just do exactly what you do. Um, and I think whilst it's noble that they're trying to achieve that, it's, it's also about the ethical side of realisation of, you know, it's not as easy as you think it is. It's what, why I've started up this whole series is to get people in to really show, you know, not how tough it is to put people off, but actually open their eyes to it. I think you've got an exciting future coming up. 2017 is going to rock. Uh, count me in for the uh, for for the um, for the event of the year that you want to put together. I'll be there for sure. And guys, uh, watch out for this space because Warren and I are going to be talking about doing some sort of combined efforts for the League of Disruptors stuff as well. So, so look, um, just, yes, yes, fire away. Yeah, just, just, just want to say thank you, Dan. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me on this platform. I think what you're doing right now with creating this platform is fantastic because a lot of people see. The end, the, the end product. They don't see the shit that you have to put up with. They don't see the stuff you have to do behind closed doors. They don't see the, the hate you get. They don't see all of that stuff where some people are judging their, 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 sh their, their judging their life based on, on somebody else's show reel. Yeah. Like what you see on someone's Facebook is, is their kind of end product. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you, Katan, for mm -hmm. allowing others to have that insight. Because I know people are going to be watching this and saying, if they can do it, I can do it too. Because yeah. I know where they started and I knew what they were facing. And I'm facing those obstacles right now. And it gives them belief. No, no, I totally appreciate that. And that's what it's here for. This is, this is, this is all about actually, like I say, putting a spotlight on your genius so others can get into theirs. Um, and that also leads me to anyone that's out there watching today as well on the fact that if you do want to come on this show and you do want to sort of have a conversation, you've got an opinion, you've got something that you want to say and, and share with the world, go to enterpriselab.co.uk forward slash L-O-D. That's L-O-D. Uh, Lima, Oscar, Diego. As my phonetics are really bad. Uh, that will give you a form you can register to become a participant in the show. Warren, keep hustling, um, keep loving. I think, you know, as Natasha has just said, right, you give 110% and your pure love, just keep doing everything that you're doing. You know, t you know, finish off 2016 as explosive as you started it. Just don't forget, you know, we did Gary V in, 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 in March. That was one heck of an event. And, and guys, if you haven't been or seen some, uh, any of Warren's events um, you know, this year, make sure that you're registering to do some, something with him next year. So on behalf of the League of Disruptors, thank you very much, Warren. And uh, to everyone out there, um, on to the next edition. I'll see you guys soon.